Hello, welcome to the channel and thanks for joining me. Today, we're gonna to take a look at the Sharp GF6060. Now, the 6060 was a radio cassette player dating from around 1980, and it was quite a decent model, to be honest, quite popular in its day. Although they're not always in the best condition these days, they are still available, which tends to suggest they were either made in quite a decent volume or they were built to last, and probably a bit of both, to be honest. Now I did have one of these in for the channel, which I did an unboxing video for, and it was a complete and utter mess. To be honest with you, I went ahead and just cracked on to do that away from the channel. It had an awful lot of work required. It was an ex-builder's one, so it was covered in paint, covered in plaster. I mean, there was literally balls of gypsum inside. I don't know how on earth it got in there. The mech was gritted up and totally filthy. It was missing an aerial. One of the channels didn't work and the FM stereo didn't work. So it needed a complete and utter strip down in the end, that one, and including even a new speaker replacement aerial, had to realign the pilot signal for the FM, completely strip and re-lube and re-grease the mech, put new belts on, put a capstan roller rubber on there. I mean, the list went on, it was a, it was a devil of a job and it would have just taken days and days and days to film and more and more to edit and I'm only a tiny channel and I couldn't commit basically the whole week to doing that one however I do have another one here today which has got a lot more promise it's much cleaner to start with and this is a one owner unit and I found this one online and I was quite attracted to this one because I did want to show a GF6060 on the channel for you guys. I have featured a 6161 and an 8080 and various other sharp units. And I've got some of the bigger ones to come, the 1990s, 91, 91s, that sort of thing. But anyway, back to this 6060. So the opportunity came to buy this one because it was shown with the instruction book and well, user manual, if you like, which is a pretty rare beast, to be honest, for one of these. And I thought, oh, that looks pretty cool. I quite like the look of that one. And in the small print in the advert, they'd also mentioned that the original box was available as well because they'd found that in the attic whilst they were putting the listing together. So it made like a, quite a nice set, I think, really. So anyways, I've gone through it now and basically the long and the short with this one is the radio seems to work on FM stereo, but the tape player doesn't work at all. Now, I'll just give you an idea. I'd go to press play and you can see it's just jammed. The whole mech, to be honest with you, is just really, really seized up and there's no point trying to do anything else. When I did try and force the issue slightly, it just got the motor to spin up and the spindles wouldn't turn or anything. So the belts have definitely gone. It wouldn't surprise me if the capstan rubber's gone on this. So we're going to have to go through the whole mech and sort that out. Now this may be a two-part video. We'll crack on with it in a minute. But I think the issue with this one is partly the tape doesn't work. But the other issue is the radio. I did say it worked. But unfortunately, unlike the filthy, dirty one that I'd worked on where the aerial was broken, it had broken at the end and not the base, if you like. So all I had to do there was unscrew the aerial and fit a new one. Now, a lot of boom boxes had an antenna screw on the back. And if you wanted to replace the whole antenna, including the base stem, all you'd have to do is unscrew that particular screw or remove that screw and you could lift the whole thing out in situ and that was all you needed to do unfortunately this particular one is actually snapped at the base and that means i can't just mount a new aerial stem to it and there is no antenna screw to remove the base from the rear so i think on this one i need to remove the entire circuit board just to get to the the base mount for the aerial so it might be a two-part video this one it might be part one might just be the cassette mech service and part two might be stripping all the innards out to get to the aerial stem either way we'll see how we go and we'll crack on with that shortly so a very quick overview then of the features as i say quite a nice unit this it's a mid-size unit but pretty laden with features and rather nice too so it's a four-way speaker system on this you've got the woofers and you've got two horn tweeters as well the volume control on the top is a master one but you do have a left and right balance control as well, coupled with the tone control. So you've got a single EQ from low to high on the tone sweep just there. With regard to the tapes then, it plays type one normal and indeed the type two chrome tapes as well. You've got your mono and stereo switch for your FM and you've got the FM stereo light and you've also got the LED sound level meter built into the top bar as well. 
Now, in terms of the tape cassette then, yes, it's a regular tape mech, but you might see there, it's got the auto program search system, so the APSS that Sharp used, and that's basically a scanning search system for selecting different tracks on the cassette by looking out for blank parts in the tape. And I'll show you that a bit later if we can get it running, but basically there's a little green telltale light to show you it working. So we'll aim for that one once we get the cassette mech serviced. So in terms of connectivity then, we've got headphone socket plus external speakers as well. We've also got a DIN socket for integration with other units. We've got external microphones in, plus the condenser mics that are built into the unit. We've also got a mixing mic as well, so if you wanted to use it as a PA system, you could hook it up to external speakers and put a mixing mic into there. And there's so many different features you could do with that, it's pretty cool. Uh, just finally, on the other side, you do have a master tuning dial plus the fine tuner for the shortwave as well. And I dare say there's a couple of other bits and pieces we've missed, but we'll pick up on those as we go. Right, okay, that's enough of an introduction, I think. Let's get this on the towel of destiny and start looking at this cassette mech. Okay, so it's on the towel of destiny. And first thing you want to do is remove the back cover. So you've got two, four, six, seven screws. And as I say, this is a one owner unit, so all the screws are present and correct. Everything unscrewed really nicely just then. Right, okay. Next thing then, we'll press eject. At least that button works, it was a bit sticky. And there is something rattling around, I can hear. Marginal, I don't know what that is. Let's have a look when we get it open. Right. Okay, dead easy this one, just peel it away. And then we've got three connectors. Just on there for the speakers. So I'm gonna get those away real quick. There's a left, a right, and a common earth. And I'll just see me back out real quick. So that's what's left of the front cover, of course. So you've got your speaker main buffer speakers just there and your tweeter on each side like so and that literally is it right we'll get that away and take a closer look at this mech okay so here we go then with the front case off We've got the dial gauge across the top obviously just here condenser mics out just to the side and then over here we've got the power amp board so we can just about make out the rear part, as it were, of the potentiometers for the volume, tone and balance. We've got the power amp section just over here, plus your connectors, of course, for your various sort of inputs and outputs off of the board just there. Also, the power transformer comes in. So this is where we supply auxiliary power to the board. And we'll probably be doing that in a little while, directly injecting 12 volts in there. And then over on this side here, we've got the radio board, of course. So fairly standard kind of configuration there. We do have the master tuner and, of course, the fine tuning as well. You've also got the bar switch, which is for your wave band selector switch just there. And there is a variable potentiometer there, which is probably for your pilot signal for your FM should that have drifted by now but i did notice that even without the aerial it was picking up fm stereo so i know that all works a treat there's no need to touch the radio board itself except for as i say we've got an issue with getting to the aerial so we'll look at that later now with regard to the tape mech then we've got the motor obviously just here and your adjustment screw there by the way it's dead easy on this one if you needed to work on it or change the the motor speed at all you can actually run the tape I love these sorts of configurations because you can literally drop your cassette in play it in situ you know and then you can just sort of use the motor adjustment screw just there and that will help you on your way 
so that's quite cool a lot of boom boxes you have to kind of put it all back together or have it have the mech stood out on hundreds of cables just trying to balance it precariously while you adjust the speed from the back and stuff like that so this is dead easy to work on right but to get to the mech though there are i think four or five screws so we've got one two yep and then there's two behind that but just before we do we need to access these two at the top so we need to get this dial gauge away and I just gently want to unpop these. Be mindful of the needle. And there's your gauge away. This one's lovely and clean. The last one I worked on, as I say, it was covered in plaster and all sorts of mess. It was just horrible. But anyway, there we go. Now we can see, and I'll zoom in a bit for you as well. There we go. We've got four screws. We'll get those out and then we can get the mech out. There are also three multi connectors for the heads, various leaf switches and an earth just there as well. So we might as well actually unplug those first. Then we can lift the mech away once we've unscrewed it. Otherwise you have to unscrew it and then try and unpick everything with just the one hand holding the mech right that's that away simple as okay next job then remove the screws for the mech and you can if you want to just mark the screw holes as a reference for later not so bad on this one but sometimes you can get lots of screws in very close proximity to each other it just gives you a aid memoir as to where the screws came from. Okay, so it literally was as simple as that. But be careful when you actually withdraw cassette mechs. Look out for things like the activation tabs for the record play bar switch and things like the dial cord and stuff like that. Just make sure you're not snarling anything up. Not just on this machine, but on any. And there you go so yeah i was talking you through that but essentially once you've got the back case off it's four screws three or four cables and literally the mech is away so behind that you can actually see the record play bar now and we'll clean this a bit later in fact the first time i touched that it felt pretty sticky then it's obviously been stuck there for many years so i'll just routinely clean the switches a bit later but i just wanted to see what the state of this radio board is yeah i think we're gonna to have to take a lot of things out to get to that antenna so that might be the next video perhaps but i think today we'll focus for a start on getting this cassette mech running because then at least we can service that get that back in and test that in the next sort of few minutes and certainly within this video so first thing then is just take a look at the cassette mech itself all built off a nice sturdy steel plate so that's all really good news it looks in pretty good condition overall the heads need a little bit of a clean but are actually in pretty good condition as i would say the same for the capstan and the pinch roller roller feels a little bit hard but we might be able to clean that up and get some rubber renew on there also though i can see the main issue that you get with these but i'll come back to that in a moment in the meantime though the counter belt that's okay yeah it's working we'll replace it anyway we'll replace it anyway but that's how you would find that one just there then on the rear there are two belts and we've got the flat drive belt there and the auto stop belt there which is <laughs> i laugh but they'll go one of two ways they'll generally go kind of hard and crispy or they'll go really soft and gooey and just get everywhere you might want to check out some of my other videos to see what an absolute mess they can be so we've got an idler tire that picks up off the base of the flywheel and then we've got the drive belt that sits on the top of the flywheel and as i say we've got the auto stop belt so that's okay right good stuff so basically we'll just get off the parts that we need to in a second but i wanted to show you the most tricky part with a lot of sharp units and that is just in here so if i just get that screw and just point it out in the base of the 
capstan if you like between the capstan and the flywheel there's a recess in the housing and there's a little rubber tire that actually goes between those gaps there and then this wheel picks up off of that and transfers the drive now this particular part does degenerate a lot and you have to kind of find something that will fit nicely in there as it happens I have something ready to go on a bit later when I put the belts on so I'll talk you through that in a bit but just wanted to show you so essentially what happens the motor powers up through here that spindle drives the flywheel on there which is of course attached to the capstan which has a rubber on it just like a, a rubber sheath on part of the capstan which drives this rubber just there and hence the take up on that reel there right okie dokie so let's just start getting this apart shall we and the first thing we'll do is just go ahead i think and get rid of the belts so the counter belt just pulls away like so and there is that one not unlike the last one i removed from one of these actually it's actually a square belt so uh, like so not square in profile but literally comes out in a square quite peculiar but there's that one right over we go and you can also if you wanted to make a reference arrow for the motor just to point you in the right direction for the keeper plate as well that comes off with two screws And we'll keep that together over there right so here we are then let's have a look at these belts well the first first one oh dear you can see that one was literally about to go it's all you might not see that with the focus but it's cracked it's a it literally is a, about to go and it feels more like plastic than a rubber so that one's definitely had it and then we've got the long since dried out slipping main drive belt whoa a nice bit of shiny one there yeah so belt wise counter belt stop belt and drive belt none of those around anymore they'll all be oversized they'll all be stretched dried out cracked right okay so there we go right next job i think is we'll withdraw the flywheel and just catch the oil wash washer on the other side just be mindful that you don't lose where are you don't lose that little washer because we'll need to put that on later and you'll see this will be probably gunked up right watch out also for the tiny little washers that you will find there's two there then they encase the little whoops framing they encase the little rubber that we put on a bit later so just keep all these little bits and pieces safe they really are tiny and you can see the mech is pretty pretty stiff now not totally greased up though to be fair so we should be able to get away with driving some alcohol through some of these mech parts loosening up the old grease cleaning it out and then re-lubing it so i'm just going to go i think now and start having a clean up have a bit of a zhuzh get all the goo and the gunk out and start lubing everything up and we'll go from there also just a quick one is don't lose the little washer on the bearing for the capstan of the flywheel there's one just there and that's the one that without that it tends to bottom out and it can catch you hear that grinding the actual flywheel will catch on the cassette mech casing so that acts as a tiny little standoff washer but also a little bit of a thrust washer as well on that bearing just there so just make sure that all the relevant bits of uh, plastic are in the right place 
and you should be okay. And here's a quick case in point about the mech being sort of gummed up. If you press play, and if I press stop now, watch how long it takes to return. There we go. It's about four seconds. It's really lazy. So once we've cleaned all this up and freed it up, it should be a bit better than that. These do have a fairly lazy response sometimes, but we can do a lot, a lot better than that. I'm sure. Some of this grease is like toothpaste when it dries. It's one of the ironies of grease, of course, it's there to help and lubricate, but over time as it dries out, it actually gums everything up even more. So uh, yeah, we just keep going away at it. Okay, I think that'll do the job just nicely. So everything's working nicely now. And if we look at where we were at before, compared to now, everything's snapping back in and out as it's supposed to so good stuff right onwards okay so the last little job at this stage is to finish cleaning up the remains of the capstan rubber in there and to do that the easiest way really is just to remove this idler so we'll just remove the little split washer here don't lose it and get the pulley off or the idler i should say and then we can get in there and give that a nice clean And if we gently just push this mechanism away against the spring and also watch out for the tiny washer underneath like so we don't want to lose that so keep that safe as well and then we can just get in here and give this a proper clean You can always use the flywheel as well for that. You can see parts of it left on there. And if we drop a little bit of alcohol through the bearing, we can also use the capstan itself gently just as a little cleaner. It's a bit like cooking meat really. Now you can put the tester in when the juice is run clear you know that it's uh, it's done but the last one I did of these honestly it was just like tar all the way through but just keep making sure that everything's nice and clean that there's no residue within the bearing itself and indeed through here in fact I can remove what's left off and I think this is it's very very unusual it's very unusual that you get any of the actual original capstan rubber in there normally it's totally degenerated by now and you all you're picking up is tar I mean you can see there you go look it's like spreading spreading butter on toast look that was the rubber and just like that it's gone and normally I've caught this just in time actually because quite often what happens is that happens whilst it's being played and uh, yeah that ends up being transferred around the entire mech which is not pleasant let me tell you good well I'm pleased about that so next is the flywheel there's a little bit of corrosion on there nothing crazy but I'm just gonna smooth this up a tiny little bit polish it up and get some alcohol just to make sure that the capstan itself is spotlessly clean 
and then we'll be getting ready to put ingredient X on there which is going to be a little bit of a rubber tubing to replace the original capstan rubber. And there we go, there's the flywheel done. I tend to use something like about a thousand grit sandpaper just to polish out any lumps of corrosion because we don't want any sort of wow and flutter and stuff like that. So we want it to be as smooth as we can but we don't want it to be necessarily polished to death because we want something for the rubber to bite onto. And I've also given this a nice clean and I'll do it another one finally before we reassemble with some alcohol because we don't want any contaminants on there because we don't want the rubber to spin on this. We want it to hold on tight when we put it in place. Anyway, that's the prep done. So time for a quick coffee now, I think, and then we'll get ready to put it all back together again and we can go from there. Just while we're talking about coffee, it'd be great to see you over on my Buy Me A Coffee page. Any support you can give me would be most welcome. If you want any advice on the sort of belt sizes and stuff like that, then you know, Buy Me A Coffee or a Super Thanks is always appreciated. Obviously, it takes a fair old bit of while getting these machines in and measuring up and scoping out belts when there's no kits anywhere else available for them. So uh, I'm trying to build a bit of a, a bit of a library of all the machines that I'm working on of the correct belt sizes. So if you do need that sort of information, then uh, give me a shout. And if you uh, hit super thanks or buy me a coffee, I'm sure I'll give you a, a personal reply to that. Anyway, right, get the kettle on, let's go. Okay, it's time to put it back together. If you can hear the rain beating on the roof and the window, no surprise, it's rained probably harder than it has done in many years and it's been on and off all day and it's got to the point now where it really is throwing it down. So we'll have that for company for a while, I think. Anyways, we've got the belts here now. So there's three belts to go on. Plus I've got a bit of tubing here for the capstan as well. So it's just a case now of reassembling everything in the correct order. So what I need to do is to put the thrust washer onto the back of there feed that through, then put one of the tiny washers, then the rubber, then another washer, then put that through, then put the oil washer on. So there's quite a lot to do. I'm just gonna carry on in my own little time here with some tweezers and just take my time threading everything through properly. And I'll see you on the other side. Okay, so I've got the take up rubber onto the capstan, just in there. And I've got the oil washer back on, so the flywheel is kind of safe where it is. But I am, I think, just going to do a little bit on this side first. Then we can put the actual backing plate on and then the flywheel is properly captive again. But before I do that, I'm just going to put a drop of oil onto the motor spindle whilst we're here. I'm just going to spin that up a few times and then get some isopropyl alcohol and just clean up these pulleys, get rid of any excess oil and just give everything a fresh surface ready for the new belts. It's always worth doing because even though the belts hadn't degenerated per se, obviously with age they do start to break up a little bit and just that there has come off of what would be in theory clean pulleys so as I say always worth just doing that just to make sure that everything's got a nice fresh running surface before you put the new belts on on to the belts then and the first one is the main drive belt there we go And we've got the stop belt just here. Nice. Yep, happy with that. So let's get this plate on. And you remember we made a little reference arrow towards the motor? Again, you didn't have to, but it's just one of those things as an idiot check. Okay, so we're just gonna turn it over now and refit that pulley. And then the split washer. So let's see if this works, shall we? Good. 
feels like there's some decent take up there so I think what we'll do next is just get the counter belt on which was the last one in the set just here very nice you can see that advancing and retarding just there not too tight you don't want them like guitar strings especially counter belts they're only there to drive that very delicate little mechanism you don't want them sucking all the uh, the energy out of the reel out of the spindle that's perfect very happy with that okay I think then we're ready to actually try this out so exciting times I'll bring the main unit back And we'll drop this in the reverse obviously of how it came out i'll save cleaning the switches and all the rest of it for when we do the aerial next time round. but for now let's just tuck this back in don't do what i did and trap the cables inside there i'm just going to pop this back out put the cables back the other side and we'll try again Okay, just a few seconds later, but uh, the cables are the right way now, so they're outside of the plate, how they should be. So we're just going to make sure we don't snarl up anything in here, make sure we avoid the dial cord and locate it correctly against the record play bar, which you can actually see underneath, which helps. Also, this is so nicely designed because there are little let outs in the plastic that allow the unit to sit there properly and also little cable ways for the, these cables here so it's absolutely a joy really and just like that we're ready to go so I'm going to put some power onto the board now and all I've got to do for that is pop out the positive and negative from the main power supply and I'm just going to hook up an auxiliary 12 volts to this now okay we've got 12 volts on the board we've got no speakers attached as yet so obviously we don't know whether or not it's working or not but the first thing we want to do is actually let's go for it put a tape in and see if it works trying to remember which one's which okay well you've got the sound of the rainfall on the window and the roof there to keep us company but I'm just watching there to make sure that the tape is turning nicely it's being pulled through and the take up reel seems to be working as well so that shows that the motor's okay, the belts are all running nicely and the take up's okay as well as far as I can see. So what I'm going to do now is actually just try and rewind it. That's going strong so all the necessary mechanism's okay and obviously the counter's going, you can see it there. Let's fast forward it. And the same is true for the fast forward. So we've got a situation there where everything's working nicely the reels are all turning nicely the counters working happy with that I'm not sure if the APSS works with or without the speakers it's probably I think it's an amplifier thing so if I was to press play we might actually be able to get it to work okay well I can see the green lights come on which is a start there you go it's obviously found silence in the track obviously we can't hear that because the speakers aren't there but it's obviously found the next gap in the track and allowed it to uh, stop there and advance happy with that that's really good news because this hasn't run for quite a while as you can imagine so I think what I might just do very quickly is just perhaps attach the speakers now we can have a listen make sure it's actually running okay without too much in the way of wow and flutter and maybe adjust the speed a bit if we need to and we might just call that a day so let's get the speakers hooked up a minute so just the three cables if you remember we've got the common earth and then we've got 
the left and right speaker positives. So, this is genuinely, genuinely the first time I've heard any noise out of this tape mech since I've owned it. So here we go. Okay, there's a bit of crackle on the volume there, but we've not cleaned it yet. So um, I'm sure we'd soon sort that out. And I'm mindful of copyright, but I'll just give you a few more seconds of this. Okay, good stuff. I'll give you a bit on the other side. Bit <laughs> of 90s uh, dance vibe stuff going on. Let's try something a bit more, perhaps, recognisable. Bearing in mind it won't sound terribly bright to you guys because the microphone's pointing at me and the speakers are currently kind of face down whilst the, uh, the face plate is kind of hanging off by the, uh, not literally by the cables, but you know what I mean. So let's have a look. Marvellous, happy with that. Okay, so we know the tape's working. We know we've got audio left and right, which is fantastic. So I'm just going to check the tape speed now. And indeed, just get an overview for what we've done with regard to the, the quality of the mech. We've put new belts on there. We've cleaned everything as best as we can. Installed a sort of makeshift take-up capstan idler rubber or whatever you want to call it. And yeah, let's just let's just see what condition it's in. To that end, I'm going to put a calibration tape in. So this one's set for three kilohertz. And what we'll do is we'll here we'll just see whether or not it's a a static kind of sine wave and see if it fluctuates. See how much wow and flutter there actually is. So we'll just give it a little play and see what we've got. That's actually not too bad, you know. I was, uh, I don't know if I was expecting worse or not, but I can live with that. Bearing in mind that that's basically in quite a vocal frequency, quite an audible frequency, and you don't tend to listen to music where you've got high-pitched kind of notes going on for that long. Obviously, if you want really premium quality and an ultra ultra stable frequency and and low wow and flutter, then you wouldn't necessarily buy a forty odd year old you know, mid-range boombox. But the point being that it's actually surprisingly good and certainly when you're listening to music, general music, pop, rock and most classical to be fair, you wouldn't even notice that that would sound great. Whether it's quite the right speed or not though, I don't quite know. It's probably not far off. So what I'll also do is just show you quickly how you can, with something as simple as one calibration tape, it might be the only tool you need really, because I'm going to just now kind of set it by ear. So if you don't have oscilloscopes and audio generators and stuff like that, you can buy calibration tapes online that have just got a recording of fixed frequencies, known frequencies. And what I'm going to do now is I've just got just got a um, kind of like a free sine wave test tone that I've just got on basically on YouTube, to be fair. And it's just a sine wave. And if I was to play that now, that's a three kilowatt tone. And if I was to play this, it's not far off, but as a musician, and you may well anyway, be able to tell that it's slightly flat, it's slightly less. So I just need to tweak the speed until we get this speed matching the speed of the test tone here. So, which is a digitally, um, digitally sort of broadcast file, but it'll be three, kilo, uh, three kilohertz tone. So I'm just going to tweak that until they kind of phase with each other. And I know I'm going to be close enough, close enough for rock and roll, as they say. So I'm just going to find a little screwdriver for the motor and we'll go from there. So I'm just going to play this tone. It might be a bit annoying for a minute, but I'm just going to, just going to turn it down until I find the right screwdriver. There we go. Perfect. So basically there's a semi-variable resistor built into the motor and what that allows us to do is adjust the voltage in minute amounts that the motors get in which will increase or decrease the speed of the motor. So all I'm going to do is just tweak this 
until it becomes the right speed. So let's go for it. That's actually not far off now. If you listen, if I go fast or slow, if I match them, there we go. That's the same note now. So I'm just going to stop that because that's really annoying, but you, you get the impression. So if I was to press this, or was to press this, we've got the same pitch now. Now, as I say, that's without an oscilloscope or anything like that. You could do it more accurately than that, but that just gives us an idea. So if we were to put a song in now that we know, or don't, or don't know if you're a Genesis fan or not, but it's one I've got around. There we go. So it'll play your music just fine now, and that's perfectly acceptable. Perfectly acceptable for listening to. All right then, so given that the tape is working, we, we know it's pretty much set. Everything's working in terms of the, the belts, the take-up rubbers and stuff like that. The motor speed is set as close as we are too worried about. I'm not gonna button it up now and put the dial gauge and stuff on because we also need to know get the aerial stem out which is tucked somewhere at the back of this board and that's all got to come out which means the mech's got to come back out anyway to get to that so I think that'll be in part two but I think we can call part one a success and we've definitely got some you know the tape we can use so that's great we've lubricated it all up new belts everything else and uh, there we go nice we can groove on to 90 sounds now. So thanks very much for watching. Do come back for part two, where as I say, we'll get the uh, the radio board out. We'll take a look at all of that, a bit more detail so that we can get to the aerial, get that sorted, give the whole thing a polish, reassemble it, and then job done. So anyway, as I say, thanks very much for watching. Do check out some of my other videos and stay safe. I'll be back soon. All the best for now. Bye bye.